This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Puck Poolies. It's Matt Larkin here with Stephen Ellis, as always, getting ready for the All-Star Weekend pretty soon, descending on Toronto, where we are. But uh, until then, we're still plugging away with some fantasy advice. Stephen, how is your team doing right now? Well, in the the one league, the six-team pool, I uh, I was pretty dominant the whole way. It looked a little concerning maybe on Saturday, but I pulled through, so I, I can't complain there. In my other pool, I led every single day until the Sunday when none of my players decided to put up points. I think I actually had three guys get just flat zeros. Well, the guy I was playing against got a bunch of 10s and 15s and didn't exactly work my favor. So despite I lost the last place in that league, so I'm now dead last. Uh, that's OK. Again, with with two injured reserve spots and eight guys injured. Hard to do a whole lot with my team. So it happens. I get it. Whatever. But uh, yeah, I can't complain. How about you? It's weird. It's uh, this happens. I've seen it in more commonly in football, but I guess it can happen in hockey, too. It's the keeper league paradox where you sell and then because you're a seller you're getting really good players like you're you know you're training four players from one really good player to build around in the future but then you have that one really good player who plays really well and then your team wins so it happened to me last week i made all these trades i set myself up with brady kachuk and tage thompson for next year kachuk has a huge week and then i win i'm like oh man i'm t- i don't want to win right now because i'm it's creep it's pushed me closer to a playoff spot again and in our league, like if you if you make the playoffs, you get three keepers. If you miss, you get four. So I don't want to make the playoffs. It's just the way it goes, man. Fantasy can be very backwards. It's just, especially when it comes to keeper and dynasty formats, it's just, it's a young man's game. So you think you're building for the future and then those players do better than the veterans you trade away sometimes. But what can you do? Let's uh, do some pickups, Steven. All right, let's start off with the shallow pickup, and that is Uka Pekka Luokanen in Buffalo. Yes, this is your guy, Stephen. UPL available in 60% of leagues. And the talk, of course, going into the season, Devin Levi was sort of anointed as the guy. It was a bit of a cautionary tale. The same thing happened to Spencer Knight in Florida a couple years ago. Great prospect, Devin Levi, but small sample size in the pros, undersized goalie. It wasn't actually a guarantee he was going to be great. And... People tend to forget that Uka Pekalukanen was arguably the best goalie prospect in the world just a f- maybe three, four years ago. He was a mega prospect of the Buffalo Sabres, and he got hurt, which slowed his development in Major Junior. He's got more of a prototypical goalie build, 6'5", 215, 24 years old. So that's more the age that you commonly see goalies come into their own. And here we are, last seven games, UPL. 948 save percentage, two shutouts, five victories. It's not inconceivable that he takes this net and becomes more of the long-term answer because people just forget this is what he was supposed to do. Maybe the light is turning on. So this is a guy you want to pick up right now in shallow leagues. If you want to read more about him, which website do you go to? Oh, yes, of course, dailyfaceoff.com. Steven recently profiled UPL. Definitely worth a read. It was last week that it was on the site, so it should be easy to find. I will point out that when I wrote it, I was a little nervous because he had one more game before uh, the, the article got published. And I'm like, uh oh, uh oh, please do well. And he got a shutout. Sure, it was against Chicago, but a shutout is a shutout. And uh, I don't think the Buffalo Sabres fans would complain about that. Medium pickup, Adam Henrique, a NASCAR fan, by the way. Oh, interesting. Yeah, available in 81% of leagues. This is not like the most exciting pickup, but sometimes not every pickup can be a UPL, a guy with a young guy with a lot of upside. In this case, Henrique. It's just sort of uh, a next man, man up situation where we have Trevor Zegers hurt. We have Alex Kalorn hurt again. And you have Adam Monrique without much competition. He's parked on the first line. He's playing second power play unit. Last 20 games, got 10 goals, 17 points. He's just getting used a lot. And he's someone who can get hot, score in bunches, can help you in the short term. Also a trade candidate in real life, which could work for or against him. But either way, it's worth monitoring. Maybe he gets traded to a situation where he gets a bigger role with better players, can score more, or maybe he ends up being a depth piece on a really good team and it actually hurts his value. Either way, right now in the short term, he's scoring and he just doesn't have a lot of competition for a fairly sizable role. So he can help you. All right. 
And the deep league pickup is Ross Colton, a fourth round pick in 2016. It took a bit to get to the NHL, but he's having a great career. Yes, Ross Colton scored the Stanley Cup winning goal in 2021 for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, I've added him added him in my deep league. He's available in 82% of leagues. And again, this is another situation where injuries are forcing a player up the lineup. The Avs are down Arturi Lekkanen and Valerie Nachushkin, so their top six is getting really juggled. Ryan Johansson hasn't really been cutting it as the number two center. So Ross Colton, who sometimes plays the wing, is getting a look as the number two center in Colorado. He's also playing on the top power play unit right now, two goals and six points in his last five games, and he's always going to give you a healthy dose of hits. So again, probably a short-term pickup. I'm sure Colorado is going to be looking for upgrades at the trade deadline. They'll get healthier. Maybe Val Nichushkin comes back from the player assistance program eventually. But right now, Colton is getting one of the best opportunities of his career, and it's working so far. All right. I like it. And the WTF pickup of the week, a guy that we're going to hear a lot about in trade uh, stories, obviously on dailyfaceoff.com as well, Elias Lindholm. Yes, Elias Lindholm is available in 36% of leagues. And the reason why I wanted to talk about him in this category is specifically because of his trade status. And I'm not really worried about his current stat line, eight goals, 30 points, and I think it's 45 games, give or take, because there's an excellent chance this player gets traded. I think with each passing day, it's more likely, and he's going to fetch a nice return. It's going to be a blockbuster deal. He's going to go to a contender. So picture Elias Lindholm with the Boston Bruins, with the Colorado Avalanche, with the Vancouver Canucks. We've seen what he can do when he plays with elite players, right? Two years removed from playing with Johnny Gaudreau, Matthew Kachuk, 40-plus goals, 80-plus points. I think that Lindholm, in the right situation, could be that productive down the stretch. This could be a league winner. So he should be owned in 100% of leagues. He should not be on the wire anywhere, even in a shallow league. He's at least a bench fodder for you if you're in a really shallow league because his role could be drastically changed his situation in the coming weeks, and he could be a super productive player down the stretch for you. All right. I like that. And this week's tip of the week is to stay alert for rapidly changing player values at this time of year which makes sense giving the trade down line we're going to be seeing some guys sitting out which is one of my most annoying things about the trade down line is guys getting like held out for cautionary purposes and then like with chicken it was like a very long time before he actually got traded and his fantasy value tanked but uh what are your thoughts here Yes, it's a really good point. And it's sort of that turbulent time of year. And there are just so many things happening at this midpoint of the season, the dog days. We've got players getting called up, players getting sent down. You have trades starting to happen. You have coaching changes, coaches trying different lines, coaches that are on the hot seat, putting their lines in a blender, teams that are struggling, having closed door meetings. And like you said, eventually asset management, players being held out to the lineup before they get traded. So just... Every team's NHL lineup in real life is so dynamic right now that you have to be really vigilant with the waiver wire, pay a lot of attention, be very reactive, have a short leash, leash, and just sort of watch what's happening. So if you look at some of the pickups I've already recommended this week, Ross Colton is a great example, Adam Monrique, those are guys whose value changed because of injuries. So this is the time of year where if you want to be competitive, especially in head-to-head -head matchups, you want to be just be extra attentive to that news cycle because it's very dynamic. It's going to keep changing right now. Early in the year, Teams are sort of just feeling themselves out. They're not necessarily going to change too much. Late in the year, they might be sort of set and understand what their lineups are going to be. But right now, the waters are very choppy. So it's important to pay a lot of attention. All right. Awesome. What is our special segment this week? Okay. Well, we're I'm embarking on the second half of the real life season. We're now, I guess, a little bit into the second half of the fantasy season, and it's still not too late to make some bold moves that can change your fate. So I'm looking at some hot takes, some stances that I think are important when evaluating what to do in the second half. All right. Let us start with Joseph Wool can still be a league winner, which is interesting considering he hasn't played in a while. We don't seem to know when exactly he's coming back, but the Toronto Maple Leafs could use him. Yes, I have not budged from this take. I said it at the start of the season. I still think it's true. If anything, everything that's happened while he's out just confirms it for me. So we know Ilya Samsonov, it's been a real adventure for him. He's not been good enough. Even Martin Jones had a really hot run, but he's still Martin Jones. He's still a third string goaltender in his mid thirties and the bubble is starting to burst there. He's been struggling a little bit more lately too. It's just a reminder that this net is still Joseph Wolves to take. He's got the high ankle sprain. Of course he is traveling with the team. So to me that suggests he's weeks away, not necessarily months away. And that means he can still probably help your team. If you're still afloat, if you have room to stash him on your bench, 
the door is just wide open for him. He's still top 10 in the NHL and save percentage at 916. And I think this is going to be your guy. If he gets healthy in time, he could be, if you if he's your third goalie, for example, you have him stashed, that could be a massive advantage for your team down the stretch. I don't anticipate the Leafs making a trade for another goalie unless they know Wool is going to be out. Like, you know, if he has a setback. Other than that, he's going to be the guy. I'm very confident in that. And he's someone you want to have stashed away. Now, he might be a league winner, but is he going to win anything meaningful in real life this season? I don't know. I mean, this version of the Leafs, the thing about them is I, I wondered this before the season because I knew, I, I predicted they'd be a lot worse. They just look like a much worse team on paper. But also I'm like, maybe they need to be one of those teams that gets in as a seven or eight seed and is really battle tested and they make the playoffs on the final day of the year. And then they friggin' go on a run and make the Stanley Cup final. Sometimes those teams fare better than the ones like the recent Leaf teams that knew their opponent were sort of locked into their playoff spot in January or even December. So who knows? This could be good for them. They're going to be a lot more uh, tested down the stretch. Yeah, you look at the Florida Panthers last year. They had to fight to the death to make the playoffs, and then they go out there and make it to the Stanley Cup final. But the Leafs, last couple of years, it's like by yeah, like you said, by January, it's like, all right, we're playing Tampa. All right, let's just kind of cruise to then. And it kind of makes a lot of those games very meaningless, especially at the end of the season last year when they were like – bringing up a different emergency goalie every single day for like a mm -hmm. week. And it's like, okay, you guys are really taking this seriously. Are you Uh hot take? Number two, the Buffalo Sabres offense isn't going to wake up. Yeah. It's been kind of a, a rough go for this group. Yeah. This disappoints me because they were so exciting last year. They were top three offense in the league. They were just entertainment incarnate. And I say this as someone who just, just traded for Tage Thompson. So I've just been keeping an eye on them, and this is a, the 25th ranked offense in the NHL. They're 26th on the power play. They're near the bottom of the league in terms of generating high danger chances. Some of it, yes, can be attributed to the injuries. They haven't had all of their forwards healthy at the same time. But overall, they're just not playing the same this year. They're a bit more conservative. They're less high octane. Maybe they're playing tighter because they felt they had something to lose with so much pressure to make the playoffs. And ironically, it's changed their identity and made them not as good of a team. But either way, if you're kind of holding your breath, in a, I'm talking redraft. So yes, I traded for Tage Thompson because I still have faith that they're going to figure it out next year and beyond. But if you're looking at what to do with Erasmus Dahlin or Tage Thompson or Alex Tuck, all those guys right now, I am not that optimistic that we're going to see Buffalo wake up and get hot down the stretch. I feel like it would have happened by now. So I'm kind of out on the Sabres in the short term for the rest of the season in fantasy in terms of a place that's a fertile environment. Now, a lot of us expected the Sabres to take a big step forward this year. Do you see that now next year? I hope so. The talent is still there. I just think they have to change a bit of personnel. I think it's our Scott Maxwell at Daily Faceoff had a good piece earlier this year that it's the veterans that are holding them back. They have a bit of dead weight there. Some guys like bringing in Eric Johnson, that was that move was doomed to fail from the start. He's a bit of an anchor, right, on possession and things like that. So I think they just have to make better decisions with which veterans they're bringing in. Maybe they have to spend some of that cap space and bring in a high-impact veteran this time. We'll see. All right. And the third and final hot take is Leo Carlson on the Anaheim Ducks is going to put himself on the map. Yeah, I'm very curious for your take on this one too, Stephen. Um, but if you look at what's going on in Anaheim, obviously Zegers is out. Cutter Goche is not coming unless he turns pro late in the year, but he's probably not going to make a big impact this year. Adam Henrique probably going to get traded. Uh, so the opportunities are going to continue to be there for Leo Carlson as pieces are getting removed from that lineup. And we know he's had that load management. He had the knee injury that cost him some time. But I'm not expecting this load management thing to stick all season because if you're not giving him a full workload down the stretch, then what are you doing? Are you going to have to load manage him next season too? If his body's not used to it, it makes no sense. They've got to play him, and I suspect they will get him into more of a rhythm in the second half. And this is a very exciting player, someone who I know you were very high on in his draft year. I see some kind of Anze Kopitar type of qualities, big guy, two-way game, can score a fair amount, drive the play as well. And he's already just, even in limited time, he's at a 25 goal, 55 point pace, roughly. So I think he's someone that's going to make an impact, especially in deep leagues. I think you want Leo Carlson in the second half. I wouldn't be surprised if he's the Ducks' top scorer from here on out. What do you think of that take? I 100% agree. Like right now, we're looking at him, you know, the over 50 point pace in the whole season, but he's still looking like he's going to get 40 points this year, 20 goals or so. So, um, you know, I, I wrote, 
right off the bat that you know don't count him out of the Calder race. That was before it was clear they were going to do this this load management stuff. But he's been playing pretty damn good otherwise. Like he's still been a top ten rookie throughout the whole season. So with the Ducks, like you said, they're going to be making some moves here. They're going to be start focusing on next year, give them that opportunity to be a leader, and then we know they're going to get a pretty good draft pick again next year. So or next year. So uh, I'm excited to see what this team's going to be doing long term. I'm a huge Anaheim Ducks believer. Leo Carlson, I feel like was almost underrated last year because of how good Bedard was, how good Fantilli was, and people may have forgotten that you know putting up about half a point per game or just over half a point per game actually in the Swedish hockey league uh, at his age was actually quite unbelievable. Something that's very rarely that we ever see. So uh, I'm a huge Leo Carlson believer. So I like this one. Who is our guest today? All right. We're going to bring back our old buddy, Nick Alberga. It's been a while. So let's get him back. Okay. We are pleased as always to bring back our friend, part of the nation network host of Leafs morning take our buddy, Nick Alberga. Nick, how are you doing, my friend? Boys, I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I can't believe the All-Star break is next week. And next thing you know, we're going to be talking about fantasy playoffs, eh? It's crazy. Stretch run is coming. And it's a lovely little transition to the first thing I wanted to ask you, my friend. Because earlier in the show, we were talking about our biggest hot takes for the second half of the season. The fantasy stretch run, if you will. So I'm curious, do you have one? You know the meme with like the guy from the movie Tangled with all the, the <laughs> knives? Like, What take has you like this? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. curious what you got. So this is going to tie into actually another question that you're going to ask me a bit later on. But uh, my hot take is that the Ottawa Senators are going to do what the Ottawa Senators do, and that's catch fire in the second half of this season when they're out of playoff contention or not going to make the postseason. So with that in mind, uh, there's no doubt in my mind I'm buying on that team. Josh Norris comes to mind. Uh, Stutzla, Giroux, Tarasenko. Um, Chicker, and I, I think it'll be intriguing to see what the Ottawa Senators do ahead of the March 8th trade deadline, as we just uh, spoke about. Obviously, a lot happening in the fantasy world over the next six to eight weeks, but uh, that's probably my hot take because they've been so bad this year, and uh, you know everybody wanted to talk about them in the offseason. I think Ottawa finds their way here in the second half, which is good news for fantasy owners, not so much in reality, right? Yep, that's true. Uh, talking about goalies here, if you have you know, anybody on Carolina or New Jersey uh, in net, are you staying the course awaiting a trade or do you want off this trade? Or like for Carolina, are you thinking Spencer Martin, Oakville uh, legend there? Is he going to save this team? Probably not. But what are your thoughts there? It's a D run for the Hills. Uh, probably the way I would answer this yeah. question. I don't know if you were to ask me and pull me what you are right now, like which team do I better have more faith in uh, to preserve anything in between the pipes? It's probably Carolina. And it's more so because of the system. And I know Svechnikov is banged up right now, but I think you look specifically at New Jersey. They're so battered, man. Like, I know the goaltending hasn't been great, but you're missing Jack Hughes for an extended period of time. Dougie Hamilton's out. Uh, Timo Meyer hasn't been the same player. Like, there's just so many question marks with that team defensively. And then I don't really trust Vanacek. I don't I don't trust Nico Dawes. I don't trust uh, Akira Schmid. And, I mean, it's taking nothing away from Carolina's crease. I don't think they trust Anzi Ranta at all. I mean, they put this guy on waivers like a month ago to go back uh, to the AHL. And then you have a guy at Spencer Martin who's bounced around the league a bit. Like, I don't think they have any faith in their guys. I think they're just hoping Carolina Kochekov comes back. But I think if I have to rank it, it's certainly Carolina ahead of New Jersey. I believe in that team way more right now. All right. Well, it's funny you mentioned uh, the Ottawa Senators and Tim Stutzler because one hot take I threw out, I think it might have just been in conversation. I forget where I even wrote it, but uh, was that I would consider trading Sam Reinhardt for Tim Stutzler, which seems crazy. Sam Reinhardt has been the fantasy MVP this mm -hmm. season, arguably relative to draft position. But I see a guy with the same numbers as Bo Horvat a year ago, shooting percentage way, way above what it should be on pace for 60 goals. That's exactly what Bo Horvat was doing last year. Then he went in the toilet in the second half. So I'm curious, are you sticking with Sam Reiner? I know you, you're a guy who's tweeted a lot about him, about how special <laughs> he's been this year. He's been your guy. Also, Brock Besser. These are two guys with the really high shooting percentages. If you own them, are you riding it for the rest of the year, or is it time to sell very, very high? Just for clarification, that isn't my guy. I'm building a market for <laughs> Sam Reinhardt because everybody loves trolling the team I cover in the Maple Leafs, so we're going to start trolling other teams, and that's exactly what I'm doing here because Reinhardt doesn't deserve 9.5. He deserves 12 million bucks a season if you're scoring at a 60-goal pace, but I digress. 15. Let's go higher. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's insane. It's lunacy. Um, 
I'm probably somewhere in between because I just think you look at how the relative ease, the way he's scoring goals, and it just seems like both guys, it seems like that type of year. Um, I think if you were to ask me, I believe more in Sam Reinhardt than I do in Brock Besser. I think everything is going right for the Vancouver Canucks right now. They're getting every bounce in the world. You reference the shooting percentages. Obviously, a guy like Besser around 22% right now. His career uh, high or career average is around 13 and a half. You know, Reinhardt's at 27% career average around 15. But I probably believe more in Reinhardt. I, I think the body of work is going to be pretty incredible this year. I just have that faith in him that I do over Brock Besser. But again, I think the, the key here is giving advice to fantasy owners. If you you come across an offer that's pretty damn good and you're getting a top 40 player, I'd be inclined to potentially pull the trigger because there's going to be a point in time, like a year from now, we talk about this and be like, ha, that's hilarious. I just feel that way. <laughs> so going back to the Ottawa Senators here, what are your thoughts here on the second half? Are you hoping for a turnaround? Are you buying or selling or just giving up on them? I'm not hoping. I, kn I know there's going to be like, this is what they do. The Buffalo Sabres guys, same conversation. That's why uh, I go out of my way to call these organizations frauds because they don't <laughs> win when it matters. Columbus in that conversation too. Like it's a, I'm so tired of these conversations every off season. And maybe we only have them on NHL fantasy on ice where I'm like, I'm not doing this again. So um, to summarize, I believe in the Ottawa senators in the second half, they're not going to make the Stanley cup playoffs, but I think from a defensive standpoint, they probably will lock things down. Uh, at the very least, I would monitor a guy like Jonas Corposalo in the second half. I think he's going to be sneaky. I mean, people probably call me crazy watching and listening to this right now, but I, I would just, you know, chill out on that. Um, and I think some other guys, like, the they score goals, and we know they score goals. And there's a couple guys who have regressed a bit this year, a Claude Giroux, a Tarasenko, a Chikrin. Um, a Norris. Uh, I mean, I think there's going to be that day a couple months from now where we're like, wow, Ottawa's a gold mine for fantasy hockey because the pressure's off, right? Once the pressure's off, I think you start to cook. And I, I really, really feel strongly about Ottawa in the second half here. This is a bad omen for my rebuild in fantasy where I keep, I'm starting to win accidentally because I, I traded for Brady Kachuk. <laughs> then I took Corpus Allo off off the buyer team's hands as a favor and Forsberg and Sogard. And I have Tarasenko. I'm like, man, my team's starting to win by accident. No, like I, I'm supposed to be tanking here. So I'm worried. I'm almost in a playoff spot. This is not good. Uh, last one for you, Nick. Uh, what's What overlooked player do you think is a, an excellent buy low for the stretch run? I'm going to go with uh, Jordan Cairo on the St. Louis Blues. Uh, since Craig Bruby was fired, he has seven goals, nine to six, uh, nine assists, excuse me, 16 points, 16 games, and one tantrum, as we know, through the media. So this guy's a stat stuffer in the fantasy world right now. I just think you look at the body work, it's extensive enough for me to be like, you know what, like this guy's going to produce for my fantasy team down the stretch. And I think a lot of people are still hesitant because I think they look at St. Louis, they made the coaching change, and Cairo doesn't have the sex appeal that other players have. So he'd be on my list. A couple other guys I would throw out there. Arturi Lekkinen could return on Wednesday for the Colorado Avalanche. And uh, we know Val Nachushkin's out. I don't know how much I believe in Jonathan Drouin long-term. So I think there's going to be a nice little cozy spot somewhere in the top six for Lekkinen. Owen Tippett's been a great story coming out of the Mississauga Steelheads organization, as we know, and has been really, really good. I know he's dealt too, but he was, he's been great this year. And uh, Joseph Wall's another guy I think should be on the periphery of fantasy owners when he does come back. I think he has the opportunity to do something seismic here. You're talking my language. That was one of my hot takes earlier in the show. Joseph like Wall, it. second half league winner. Well, Nick, pleasure to have you on as always. Before you go, what do you want to plug today, buddy? Uh, nothing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, at the Leafs, uh, <laughs> at the Leafs Nation 401, Leafs Morning Take, uh, live Monday to Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And it's me and former Maple Leaf Jay Rosal. And we just talk about the Maple Leafs. It's a pretty crazy concept, guys. <laughs> it's a great show. Be sure to check it out. And Nick, always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Great to have him on. Always great to have our buddy on the show. And you can remember to check out Leafs Morning Take every day at 11. And okay. Next, Stephen, we're going to talk about our best bet of the week. And I don't believe these odds are up yet, but I just want to talk about it because we, we discussed it on Daily Faceoff last week. We were looking ahead to that skills competition with 12 players, 10 of whom have been named so far. And on places like Botano, there will be odds eventually for picking the winner. So keep an eye on them. But uh, we had a mini draft on Daily Faceoff. Everybody picked who they thought would be the winner. I had the fourth pick. But honestly, 
I would have considered Elias Patterson with the first pick. I think he is perfectly built to win this competition. You have to remember, it's not about just picking the best pure talent. It's who has the, the widest array of skills that can lend to this competition. We know Elias Patterson, people kind of sleep on him as a hard shooter. He's the reigning hardest shot champion. I feel like that's not discussed very often. Over 103 miles an hour in the last All-Star game. He's fast. So fastest skater, I don't think he's going to be bringing up the rear. He's got great hands. So for breakaway challenge, I think he'll be strong there. And of course, what's the other category I'm forgetting for him? Oh, accuracy shooting. He's got an actual laser of a wrist shot as well. So I'm just looking at all the skills he has. I think he's got a little bit of everything. You know, maybe Austin Matthews has the power. He's going to be great at the wrist shot element for accuracy shooting, but he's not going to be the fastest guy out there. McDavid's going to have great speed, but maybe he's not going to have the hardest shot. I think that Pedersen has the best combination of skills for this crazy event which i think is actually going to be pretty fun eight different events 12 skaters so he's my pick and i recommend placing a bet on him because you're going to get pretty good odds i'm sure it's going to be minus money for mcdavid it's going to be kale mccarr it's going to be nikita kucherov matthews all those guys nathan mckinnon the odds will be i think the value is not going to be as good for them i think you're going to want Pedersen. he's going to give you a nice return on your investment what do you think of that i like that one obviously the the default is to go to McDavid, but I, and I would even argue one of the defensemen have a good opportunity here. But when it comes to with Pedersen, it's like when it comes to like who the fastest skater is or who who gets the hardest shot, it's often not the player you would fully expect it to be each time. Uh, so uh, Vancouver Canucks fans know what Elias Pedersen could do, and I think they're going to be betting on him no matter what. But I think the rest of the the, the fan bases should start to kind of get on that because Pedersen is he's the real deal, man. So I, I like that one. And I also think that William Nylander is a sleeper, by the way, because yeah. he, again, he's another guy that has very versatile skills. He's fast, great hands. He can shoot the puck. And he's just got that swagger. He has that just give zero Fs thing going on, and he'll be in his home rank. I wouldn't be surprised to see him put on a show. So he's the deep sleeper. I'd be placing bets on those two, those two suites. Uh, okay, Stephen, let's talk prospects. I'm curious to know more about this one because you have a story on him on Daily Faceoff right now about how much of a steal he is for the Philadelphia Flyers. So tell me about Massimo Rizzo. So if you don't know much about Massimo Rizzo, he was acquired over the summer from the Carolina Hurricanes uh, by the Philadelphia Flyers for a guy who will never come over to the NHL. So it was a bit of a freebie there. And I think a lot of people were interested in that one because you look at how good Rizzo was last year, at the University of Denver. He had 46 points in 38 games as a sophomore. He had 36 points as a rookie, which if you're in the 30-point range uh, in your first two seasons of college hockey, you're a pretty good player. And it doesn't always mean that's going to translate over. But that means you could produce quite well at the NCAA level. This year, though, he's already at 42 points in 24 games. Like, we're looking at 65, 70 points this year. He's the top scoring player in the NCAA. He's been that since taking over from Macklin Celebrini pretty early on. So, uh, a lot of intrigue there. He also got to play with the Spengler Cup, uh, Team Canada. Uh, it was his third time representing Canada at any international tournament. I thought that was his best showing. I thought he, when he played at the World Junior A Challenge in 2018 and 2019, he was just fine. But this is a guy that we knew he could produce. But I don't think we expect him to produce like he is because when he played at the Penticton V's he showed a lot of promise in the BCHL but he he had 39 points as a rookie and then the second year he had 40 points in 37 games it was uh, uh, injury impacted but he never like blew away offensively like what you'd expect his best offensive production has come at the highest level of hockey he's ever played so you know as a seventh round player you can consider that bit of a late bloomer. I guess the one concern about maybe why he might not be the, the highest rated prospect right now is he's not big. He's five foot ten. He gets pushed around a bit easy. And his skating's not great. It has improved over the last two years. That was a huge weakness in his game when he was drafted and why he fell to the seventh round. But the skill level is tremendous. I know a lot of scouts were high on him back a couple of years ago, but were just worried he wasn't fast or strong enough to kind of take that that leads to the next level. I'm not sure he will be a massive impact player um, when he makes the NHL, but with the Flyers now that their prospect pool looks a little bit different than it did a few weeks ago, it is someone that is intriguing because it costs nothing to get him. He was a seventh round pick to begin with by Carolina and that type of low invest, like low cost to get this investment here. It could be huge. So good chance this becomes a nice payoff for the Flyers. If not, not much risk there, but I think just the way that we're seeing him produce this year, if he turns pro at the end of the season, maybe he starts next year in the AHL to kind of get a bit more physically ready, but I like where he's going at this point. 
Very interesting. And a nice little steal of a trade from Danny Barrier, who's starting to build something out there in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And especially when you consider, you know, with Cutter Goche, his hand was forced there, right? And getting Jamie Drysdale as well. And this team succeeding beyond, uh, I think, what anyone expected. So it's interesting to watch those, those flyers right now. Uh, Steven, let's move to some questions now. What do we have this week? All right. This first question comes from German Jaguar, who asks, Cam Talbot has fallen off a cliff all of a sudden. What's your play with him? And if I'm last, if I'm correct, he hasn't won since like December, correct? Yeah, the Kings in general have been struggling, right? And Cam Talbot was, I think, a Vezina Trophy candidate over the first mm -hmm. few weeks of the season. What I'm seeing now is not a big surprise. This is a goaltender in his mid-30s who's had a lot of injury problems, durability problems. And I think you're seeing him wear down a little bit. The good news is he's still healthy. There hasn't been an injury that has been reported. I just think he's playing more than he has in a long time and it's just starting to take a toll on him so i'm actually not that worried because if we see what david riddick has done he's come in recently and gone in a hot run i actually think that's great news for cam talbot i don't consider consider that to be a threat i think that's a better sign that the kings are getting some better backup goaltending which means they can give cam talbot a bit more of a rest and i think that will help him so I think the crash has already kind of happened now. So if you have him, I actually would hold him at this point rather than sell him when he's already gone a bit lower in value. So I'm expecting a little bit of a rebound as long as he can stay healthy. Okay, I like that. Now, it, again, further proof goaltending makes no sense where David Riddick was one of the worst goalies in the NHL the last couple of years, and he's like saving the Kings right now. Like. It's ridiculous. And I, I can plug a story later this week. I'm going to have a story on Daily Faceoff about that. Just why, why is goaltending, right? Like it's just, it's the most random position in all of sports. And uh, I've been talking to some goalie analysts trying to understand why it changes game to game, player to player, year to year. So watch for that later this week. It's also why like this week, this year, I wasn't willing to put anybody in my first round or the, even in my most, most recent NHL draft rankings, put anyone in the top 50 of any goalies because, yeah, there's some decent goalies, but I don't trust any of them. <laughs> there's not a single one I trust. You look at goalies that were the great at the start of the year have fallen off a cliff. And you look at last year, a guy that no one had really heard of in the first half of the season, Adam Gayon, ends up becoming one of the best goalie prospects in the draft. Like I don't trust goalies in the yeah, draft. That's fair. I mean, not even like Andre Vasilevsky is the poster, bo the poster boy for, oh, he's the one goalie you can trust. Not this year. Basically, it's Connor Hellebuck is the one guy you can set your watch to. Even UC Saros, Jake Ottinger have had down years. Ottinger hurt. You just can't trust these goalies, man. <laughs> yeah, like my one pool, I thought I was really smart picking Ottinger and uh, just Sturkin pretty early. And those guys have not paid off for me in that pool. It's just Sturkin just not been as good as he could be and Ottinger being hurt like almost every day it seems like at this point. So uh, my, my new strategy is just I know you guys do it in your pool, but just picking the goalies from one team and just like in this case, I have Scott Wedgwood. So, okay, well, I know Wedgwood we're playing on, he's playing on Dallas should be able to get some wins there. It should be okay. But when Ottinger's back, that'll be nice. But uh, he was, I believe he's out again right now. Uh, this question comes from ZZ or ZZ. Alex Lyon or Nico Dawes, who do you like more the rest of the way? Now, I've picked up Alex Lyon three times in my pool already, and he actually was the reason I won two of the matchups that I did. So uh, I will always appreciate him. But Nico Dawes, a guy that sentimentally, it was really fun watching him kind of go from this unknown goalie that just kind of rose through the ranks really late in his OHL career. And it's, you know, he missed a lot of the season injured, but he's playing well. Yeah, and I, I will give a disclaimer. This question from ZZ, I think, came a few days ago. So things have changed a little bit for Dawes already. Um, Dawes obviously was recommended in our, in our previous episode because of the opportunity he's receiving in New Jersey with Kira Schmidt sent down, Vitek Vanacek struggling so badly. But even Dawes, the bubble has already started to burst a little bit. He's hit the skids uh, since we talked about him on the show. And it's just a reminder, he might just be a career AHL goalie who happens to be getting a shot in the NHL. Sample size, very small. We still don't really know what the Devils have in him. It's also still possible they trade for a goalie. So I stand by the recommendation to pick him up in the short term. But if we're comparing him to Alex Lyon, I feel much more confident in Lyon who has a better, still small, but better sample size uh, of, of succeeding in the NHL, dating back to what he did last year as well. And Detroit, they still have James Reimer, Billy Huso. So it's not like Detroit's going to be trading for another goalie. We don't have to worry about a fourth goalie coming into the picture. Lion has held those two off to sort of get the Lions share, pun intended, of the starts in Detroit. So 
I feel like the net is his until he hits the skids. So I'm more confident in line at the moment than Nico does. Also, at this point, with again how weird goaltending is at this point, if Detroit needed another goalie, why not just call up Sebastian Kosa at that point and just say, "Why not? Let's see what happens." Like, yeah, <laughs> he's a good goalie prospect, one of the best in the game. Like, whatever, just do what you want. But uh, yeah, so that's that. It is starting lineup time, and I'm a big fan of uh, old style goons, guys that basically had no talent but just were there to fight people. And you still see that from time to time in the the FPHL, the SPHL, the LNAH, maybe not the LNAH as much as it used to be, where it was like you were guaranteed like a line brawl at least once a month somewhere in the league. But uh, give me your all grit all star team. Okay, so. I bent the rules for this on purpose just to mess with you, okay? So I want my team to win games. Fair. My, my squad is out there. They're going to hurt you. They're going to intimidate. They're going to fight, but they're going to win. So I built a team with players who are capable of violence, but also players who have talent. So I'm not just going for the pure Tony twists of the world. I, I zagged a little bit on this, okay? Because, again, these are all-stars, right? So in net, goalie, not a big surprise. you got to go Ron Hextall. Yes, of course, he... May have lost that one fight to Felix Pot fan, but Hextall, you know, this is a goalie who would leave his net and like throw big hits. And, you know, it, it was either him or Billy Smith. They're the two poster children for violence among goalies. Ray Emery as well, the late Ray Emery. But I'm going Ron Hextall. He's the violence goat in net. Defense, Scott Stevens, of course. Stevens can fight if he needs to, absolutely, but also he's just going to lay you out. And then on the other side of the defense, I'm going really old school. Sprague Cleghorn. This guy was an absolute absolute sociopath, a criminal on skates. He dates back to the original Ottawa Senators. Like he committed crimes on the ice. He attacked people with sticks. You need to read the rap sheet on this guy. Like Hall of Fame talent, but also just an absolute psycho on the ice. So basically, you don't you don't even want to bring the puck into my all-star team zone because Sprague Cleghorn is going to attack you with his stick. Scott Stevens is going to drill you with a hit that's probably illegal in today's game. And if you get past them, then Ron Hextall is going to come after you, okay? When the puck's in the other team zone, I've got a dominant forward line of Hall of Fame forwards, okay? I've got Brendan Shanahan, Eric Lindros, Jerome McGinley, because these guys have size. They're going to hurt you. They're going to hit you. They're going to forecheck. They have goal-scoring ability, and they're all tough as nails. You don't want to mess with any of these guys. So this entire lineup, I think, is going to score a lot of goals, and just dish out a ton of punishment everywhere. It's going to be very violent out there. And that's the assignment. And that is my all-star grit team. Shout out to Gordie Howe. I almost put Gordie Howe in there. But I decided I want I wanted more of a modern sniper's release, which is why I put Jerome McGinley in as my right winger. Okay, fair enough. Good team. See, my, I would have just gone just total, like, talentless goon, like, face off. We're going to just beat you up. We're going to win those fights. And that's how we're going to win the game. And that's how I do it. It should be NHL hit style where if you lose the fight, you're out. If you win the style, you win the fight, you get to stay in the game. That's how I would do it. Okay. I think that's fair as well. I that, like that's that. how my team would win. I like that. those criteria as well. Okay. So that's it for this week, everybody. We'll be back next week right before the All-Star game. And good luck with your week in fantasy.